Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. Well, welcome to Face to Face, and we are, uh, we've got a returning guest today. It's uh, Russ Ford. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining us today, Russ. My pleasure. Yeah. So Russ, Russ is the former executive director of LAMP Community Health Center. If you've listened to the podcast and if you have, uh, you, you will know. And if you haven't, uh, first of all, shame on you. And I hope you go back and you check it out. Russ was a great guest. Um, and maybe almost a year ago now. Yeah, well, I think you invited me to make up amends for my last performance. Right? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> some, something like that. The, uh, probably the most interesting news um, for the podcast is Russ is now running for election council, uh, Toronto council, that is, and and uh, election coming up October 27th, Ward 6, South. South of, Etobicoke. South of the Gardener in the old city of Etobicoke. South of the Gardener in old city of Etobicoke. So we're in Toronto. Um, we've got global listenership here, Russ. Okay. You know, around the globe. Hey, anybody you know. in the world can know somebody in Wards. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Are the issues the same here um, that you might find in another part of Canada or in another part of North America or another part of the world? Are people still concerned about the same things? I think so. I mean, I think that we're, we're facing... Um, what I would call a common urban agenda. Hmm. And uh, we've got to the point where cities like Toronto have grown to such a size and uh, they're experiencing some of the issues that go along with being a big city. Plus there's also how do you cope with it? What is the response of council? And you know, the past four years has not been good for the city of Toronto. I, would, I, I used to say it was uh, wasted four years, but actually it was worse than wasted because some decisions are made that are going to have greater impact on the city longer term than just being benign. So, yeah, I, I think I think urban issues are very common. There's issues of transportation, poverty, uh, the role of government is a big one in, in, in an urban setting. You know, an activist government or more private market kind of facilitative government, whatever you want to call. It. So there are there are very common issues. You know, I think in all cities. Okay, so we just do- dove right in. Um, sure. First, before let's let's uh, let's just get a couple things out of the way before we go back okay. to the whole common urban agenda. I know where I like, we're I going. Love that phrase. Yes. So, are, is there any relation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it's true. I am related to Harrison Ford. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Who would want to be related to Han Solo, right? How can you know? That's unbelievable. We gotta we gotta capitalize on that. Yeah, I know. It, it's kind of ironic. Han Solo, yeah, Indiana Jones, absolutely, Rick right? Deckard from Blade yeah, Runner. This you know, is just too good superheroes, to be true. right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean it's kind of ironic that in some ways my name is the same as the mayor, which who I think you're referring to. Uh, and yet I am running against one of the mayor's strongest supporters. And I'm not a supporter of the mayor. So it's kind of ironic in that sense that people are asking me if I'm related to the mayor when in fact I'm running against one of his best uh, loyal troops. Members. How, how, how long would you say now that you've been campaigning for a couple of months, mm-hmm. you've got a team together, you've got some financial supporters out there and hoping for some more along the way for sure. How long would you say you've been campaigning? Like, in, uh, like really campaigning? Yeah, I made the decision on St. Patrick's Day for no apparent reason other than it seemed a good idea. I registered on St. Patrick's Day and actually my sister works at City Hall and she told the uh, City Hall Press Corps that another Ford from Etobicoke was coming to register, right? And uh, and they assumed as that it must be related to the mayor. So as soon as I opened the door to register, I just got swarmed. I mean, <laughs> swarmed with every media in Toronto wanting to know, are you related? No. Okay, well then tell us what you think. You know, all of a sudden, yes, I needed a new shirt real quickly because I was totally not expecting that. Uh, seriously, I've been, I've been seriously running... Um, uh, I, I left LAMP, I believe it was July the 11th, and I've been pretty much out every day since July 11th, and uh, knocking on doors, talking to people, that kind of stuff. I didn't do any real campaigning before that because I didn't want a conflict with my job. Oh, right, of course. So, I, you know, I could have stayed at LAMP longer. 
Uh, the board said you have to leave 60 days before the vote. I left like 110 days before. But I decided that, uh, you know, as a first-time candidate, I needed to get out there. And so you didn't just decide on it the night before St. Patrick's Day, hey, this no. is a good idea. I was a drunken stupor on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> is, this, is this something you've been sort of thinking about for quite some time? I mean, you're pretty, pretty present in the community. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, working at a, a, a local agency that's connecting with a lot of people right. uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You're, you're aware of the issues. Well, it started, I guess, a couple of years back, probably about two years ago, when I decided to look for a candidate who I thought could beat the incumbent and therefore, you know, take a supporter away from the mayor. So I spent some time looking at people who might run, who, who I would, could support and who had a chance of winning. And uh, I didn't come up with anybody who was receptive. So after doing that for a while, I finally decided, well, I just can't let this, you know, this, this go. And uh, if I can't find anybody, I guess I have to do it myself. I mean, that's what I've always told my children, right? You got a choice in life. You can complain and sit on the sidelines, or you can actually do what you think is needed. So I guess uh, about a year ago, I made the commitment, although I went back and forth on it many times, including the night before St. Patrick's Day. Wow, okay. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say I've been serious about it for about a year. Did you ever see this happening? Like, did you? No, think this was no, a no, and especially at uh, at my age. I mean, I'm 60 years old. This is not exactly a career move for me, but uh, you know, I was caught in the crosshairs of emotion between anger and hope. I guess, angry at what's going on at the city, what's going on in our ward, and I guess the other side is hopeful that that we can make change. I mean, I think you got to go into politics believing you can make change. Now, you may get worn down to a pencil stub after a while if you get elected <laughs> and realize you've got one small little voice. But I think you got to go in with the idea that, you know, there's something I want to do. Now, there are people I know who go into politics for different reasons, for status, for whatever. But, you know, the politicians who I admire are people who actually went into it because they saw something they wanted to change. Do you think anybody comes out of politics still feeling the same way? Yeah. Or do you think that's rare? I think it's rare. I mean, I talked to a, a politician, a friend of mine who had been in politics for many years, and she said basically many people, in fact, she didn't say all people, but a lot of people do go into politics for the right reason. And then after a while, it becomes about getting reelected, and it becomes about chasing the vote and making the popular decisions not the right thing. That's the advantage I've got at my age. You know, I, as I say, it's not at my age, it's not a career, so I can voice the unpopular positions. Well, yeah. what's kind of interesting to me is you, you, I love your phrase about anger and hope yeah. and, and landing somewhere in between. And I would imagine as a politician, as a good politician, depending on the day, you could be really angry or you could be really hopeful, I would imagine as well, right? So it's yeah. gonna, it's gonna, the pendulum's gonna swing from time to time. Absolutely. But maybe you're in a position, Russ, where you don't have to really give that much, <laughs> I was gonna use, the, I, I love the phrase rat's ass, but, but right. you care, you deeply care about the issues. You care right. about this common urban agenda. You right. care about transportation and poverty and so right. on. You're out there meeting people, but at the same time... It's, it's not a it's career. Part, it's, it's not a career choice for you. This right. is not a part of t a time in your life where it's really going to matter that much, I suppose, right. in, the, in the grander scheme of things. Absolutely. So maybe, just maybe, this is an effective way yeah. of getting involved. Yeah, and I, I find as I... Or get, an, an effective strategy. I yeah, and, and you're, in a, you're kind of liberated. You can say what you want to say right. and uh, that kind of thing. So I think, uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that... Uh, you know, obviously, I'm not going to run to lose, or if I get right. elected, I'm not going to run not to get reelected. Sure, but uh, it's not the most important thing. Well, and once you're, you know, once they dangle the wine, the women, and Absolutely. you know, the food. That's you know, what I'm I mean, looking for. That's a real. You know, that's the, a real agenda. The limos. Let's be honest. I mean, come on. Yes, really? exactly. This is <laughs> Toronto Council. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> We've got a long. I don't even rich think. You, I don't even think us. you get a sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's pretty funny. So, so let's go back to this common urban agenda. Right. You mentioned you mentioned transportation. You mentioned poverty. Um, we talked offline briefly about about how you know what is winning a campaign really about? What 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 are the issues really about when when you get face to face with somebody at the door? Yeah. You know, in South Etobicoke, and you talked a lot about really about the relational side of it, the face to face, the fact that yeah. wow, I'm. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen a politician at my door before. Russ, uh, thanks mm -hmm. for coming, and by the way, I'm going to vote for you. Yeah, no, you I, know? I've had that experience many times. 
uh, particularly in what I would call the lower income communities, because hmm. politicians, even on the left, uh, don't usually spend a lot of time in low income communities. And that's one of the things I've done differently in this campaign. I spent a lot of time in low income communities and much to the chagrin of some of my uh, supporters who say, well, you're wasting your time because they don't vote. But uh, it's a chicken and egg argument. They don't vote because no one's speaking of their agenda. So, uh, you know, one of my long-term goals is uh, when I leave politics, if I get elected, is to have a voter participation rate in the hmm. low-income areas equal or better than uh, the other areas of the ward, because we have a very diverse ward in terms of uh, financial wherewithal. So, and, and in terms of the personal, I mean, I, I started out talking about the big issues facing the city, and I got very little response at the door. And then I realized one day, for most people, that's not what it's about. For most people, it's about service. It's about, I call my counselor, my counselor re responds. And that's not something we've had in this community for a long time. And, uh, you know, being a, a social service provider and all that, I'm very much aware of that kind of thing. So, you know, just the idea that I will return your, call, your phone calls, I am at your door, I think has an impact on people and how they vote. And, and it should. You know, it should. You sh politicians should work for the people, right? And uh, so when I when people say you're the first person to come to the door, well, that's kind of appalling in a lot it's, of ways. It's a bit of an indictment, frankly. Yes. Really, isn't it? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I'm out every day knocking on doors, and I'll continue to do that because it's important to hear from people. And it's important to hear from people who don't have a voice because you can be the catalyst. Could you ever imagine yourself in let's say three to five years time you've been successful you're you're re you're reelected i got the limo it's down, yeah. you've got the limo that's right <laughs> it's down the road um could you ever imagine not having time for those in your in your writing i hope not yeah i mean i know how it people oh, say exactly, it changes right? you and and you do get pulled away right of course you there's do. debates yeah. at city hall about the bigger city issues and you can't ignore those either yeah you know you yeah. have to have a vision for what you believe the city should be so it's it's very seductive to get lured into City Hall and debate some motion that may really not affect all that many people, but somehow it feels yeah, important, yeah. right? So there's, and of course, people want your time. I mean, one yep. thing I found being a candidate, I'm, I'm getting invited to dinners and all these kinds of things, right? I mean, the money's just going out to buy tickets yeah. to dinners, right? So it's very seductive in that sense. But I think you always, you know, even, even the days where I'm really tired and I don't want to go canvassing, I always remind myself, why am I doing this? And when I remember why I'm doing this, then I get back out there. And I hope it will be the same as I spend time here. Why am I doing this? Well, it's not to get wined and dined. It's not right, to get right. caught up in some esoteric discussion at City Hall. It's about being represent bringing representation to people who are not being represented. Well, I mean, isn't that really what you've been doing at LAMP? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think so. I like we, we spend a lot of time trying to engage people and we engage youth in political discussions and things like that. So obviously nonpartisan, of course, but you know, it's about building citizenship, I guess is the best way to describe it. And I do think that's a function of a politician to, to facilitate that. And I do think that uh, that's sorely lacking who, by most. Who, who are some of your political, uh, ah, I was gonna say political heroes, but some, some of the Canadian, American, uh, yeah. overseas, any, any uh, Well, I mean, I, I think the person, there's two people who actually got me involved in politics. They don't know this, of course, from a distance. Actually, three. Um, Stephen Lewis. Oh, uh, wow. Stephen Lewis, who at the time was the uh, head of the NDP when I first got really interested in politics. And Stephen, of course, went on to the United Nations and that. I just wrote a blog about Stephen Lewis. Oh, okay, just all right. published it last week. I'm okay. taking it global. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think another per fan. another person back in my early days would have to be Prime Minister Trudeau. Okay. Uh, again, because Justin. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think because Pierre was someone who I think rightly or wrongly went in with principles and convictions and sure. tried to yep. act on those. Yep. Uh, another person who I admired was uh, former Mayor John Sewell. Same thing. He, you know, regardless of the uh, political fallout, he spoke his truth. And I think a politician who speaks their truth, and of course truth is very elusive, but if you speak what you believe to be true, those are the kind of politicians that I admire. Have you had to... So, so that doesn't help your international audience, I know. No, that's <laughs> fine. No, this is all about the local uh, edge. Have you found that you've had to compromise your truth at all? That you've had to pull back? That you've yeah. had your... I mean, you've, you've, you have a campaign manager already? 
Yeah, you've yes. got a you've got a team behind you. Yes, you must have meetings about yes. what's the right thing to do. Yes. What's you can't the right say thing that, Russ. Yes, <laughs> you can't <laughs> say that, Russ. That'll be the T-shirt for your yes. campaign. Yes, yes. Um, I haven't compromised the message, and I right. and I you know this is a this is a, a line that moves right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have one of my favorite scenes, and I talk about it all the time. I'm sure it's on a dozen podcasts. Al Pacino in a movie. I believe it was City Hall quite a few years ago I said hey listen I don't want to cross the line I just want to I just want to move it a little bit yeah right yeah don't want to don't want to step over it just well to, you know. as you know change is incremental right yeah that's right, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. nice plug yes. for the new book that's uh, right. by David Peck on Amazon.ca exactly. check thank it out you. folks thank you thank you thanks Russ um, yeah it, I don't think I've compromised the message but I think I've toned down my rhetoric okay you know that's the best way you can't say that okay can I say it this way okay well, I, you know you know what I mean, and yeah, sure. and I understand that. And someone says, "Well, you can say that when you get elected," but I understand that it is, you know, how I talk about politics is not necessarily the way most people at the door are going to react well to it. Right. You know, so right. you got you got to you got to phrase it in a way that is um, more understand. I don't know, understandable is not the word, but uh, it, it, it comes a little bit more rear. I'm, I'm not going to be talking about political philosophy at the door. Right. right, right. So I right. haven't changed my message. You know, my message is about social justice. It is about inclusion, but I don't use those kinds of words. I guess, and uh, I talk about building community instead, or you know, getting people involved. Those kinds of words. So I've toned my rhetoric down, but I haven't changed my message. Is this is this why Stephen Lewis failed as a politician? I mean, he I, I, I've worked with him a few times, seen mm -hmm. him speak, mm -hmm. and he makes jokes mm -hmm. about his very short career. You know, in <laughs> yes. the political realm. Yes. An academic realm, yes, actually, you know, yes. very self-deprecating. And do you think that's part of the reason why? Because he Absolutely. was, he wouldn't adjust his message. He wasn't about toning it down. Could be, could be. Uh, actually, I thought you were going the other way because uh, my memory back in history was Stephen Lewis. I thought had a shot of forming the government right. at one mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. And I thought he toned his rhetoric down so much Interesting. that he wow. lost. You know what? Maybe he did, and I maybe he just uses this yeah, you know, when he yeah. speaks to get a yes. couple of good laughs. Yes. And, you know, I didn't do too well in that whole. Yes. You know, but uh, I, when he was in opposition, yeah, when yeah. he was not toning his rhetoric down, right. I mean, he said, "Wow, this is a guy. This is a guy who really believes in what he's saying, yeah. and he's you know on the right side of so many causes, right?" But I actually said, "Oh, Stephen, man, you're toning it down too much in the election that he lost, which, rightly or wrongly." we thought he could form the government. Right. I've often thought, and I would imagine a lot of people think this way, um, what I'm really looking for in a politician who is somebody who is human, somebody yeah. who's honest, somebody who does come to the door, somebody who cracks a few jokes, mm -hmm. somebody who is, who is broken and is not afraid to admit it. Yes. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of like everybody else out here, just so you know. So you're talking about the mayor now. <laughs> that's right. Yes. <laughs> Define yeah, broken. Yeah, that's right. Define <laughs> broken. There are levels of brokenness. There's no question. But you know what? I, I Okay, maybe in, 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 in Rob Ford's case it would have been a little different. We're talking about some pretty serious yes. issues here. Absolutely. Legal, yes. personal, relational, all yes. kinds of things that raise other questions. Mm -hmm. I get that. But I guess maybe what I'm talking about are struggles that you might have. So maybe, you know, maybe it bubbles to the surface that you are an alcoholic, or I'm not saying you are, but Thank somebody you. is, <laughs> and and you know, you speak to it. Yeah. You know, and you take an honest approach, and it's a, you it's know, a tough one, and it is dependent on what. I remember a guy by the name of I can't remember his first name, Eagleton. Do you remember Eagleton? I do. Art 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 not, was not, no. not Art Eagleton. Thank you. Thomas Eagleton. Thomas Eagleton, okay. Thomas Eagleton was George McGovern's vice presidential nominee for three days. Okay. And then it was discovered that uh, Thomas Eagleton had been under the care of a psychiatrist. Right. The classic stuff that you and see on TV shows. Gone. Right? Gone, gone, gone in three days, right? I mean, you couldn't be divorced and run for politics back when I was a kid. Right. So I think our tolerance has certainly grown. Has changed. I, I think that, uh, well, the media scrutiny is obviously much greater too, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, that's why I think Rob Ford is kind of unique. I mean, how many guys have lost their political career because they couldn't keep their pants on? Right. A lot. Right. right? Rob Ford, uh, what does he have to do? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. yeah and yeah. so... It is kind of remarkable in a way. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think, I think there is a more of a tolerance, but sometimes I think the tolerance is hidden. Like, we'll take uh, George Smitherman, for example, who ran for mayor of Toronto last time, who was openly gay. Um, that never came up in the media. But I know it was an issue yeah. in some communities. There's, I know there are people who would not vote for someone who was openly gay. Right, right. right. 
So I think it's very issue dependent. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anthony Weiner in the United States, right? Yeah. Was forgiven, did it again. Yeah. Not forgiven. Not forgiven the second time around. Right. Yeah. But he was leading the polls to be mayor of New York when the second time came around. Yeah. Well, I think, too, I really wonder about that. I remember, I, it, wasn't it really more that he lied? Wasn't it the flat out lie, than yeah. the actual offense itself? That really I guess seemed so, to but, I, but I think the same offense again. Right. Come on. And his wife has to be trotted out there again. I know. Pretty horrifying, really, yeah. when you look at it from a family perspective. Yeah, and, and, exactly. and dragging your, yes. your friends and so on through the dirt. Yeah. Yes. So it's, yeah, a tu- it's a tough call. It is a tough one, and I'm not even sure what I'm talking about. I, I, I think a lot of it, you're right, I think a lot of it's issues dependent, and, and also on how you're positioned in the media, yes, right? Yes. If the media likes you and you're honest, yes. now you're p- positioned as an ethical guy, is, yes. you know, isn't he yes. wonderful, is, you know? Yes. Um, but if they don't like you, you're, you're, you're probably going to be uh, painted with a yeah. different color brush. Yeah, and it depends like. on the issue too, right? Yeah. I think yeah. we're much more tolerant of mental health, for example. Right. But if someone had their hands in the cookie jar, probably I not. I know. Tolerant. Isn't it interesting, eh? Yeah. What we define well, as, uh, as as good and bad. And so Rob Ford's response when he's first, th- well, I've saved the city a billion dollars. So, yeah. Or whatever it was, you know. Whatever, whatever, whatever number he wanted to make up. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, look at, uh, you know, going back in time, Ronald Reagan could go to war and sell arms to Contras. Right. And right. violate the Constitution up and down the yin-yang. Yeah. And yet... Uh, Gary Hart, who was one of his potential opponents, uh, was skewered by not keeping his pants on. Yeah. So what you know, morality seems to be pretty relative. You yes. Know? And yeah. Rob Ford gets a lot of support because people think he's every man. Well, he's just a regular guy, really. A regular guy takes crack cocaine and You're right. hangs out with underworld type characters. Well, there's one. There's a. There's there's making mistakes. I think. Yes. Right. And yes. then there and there's brokenness. And then there's patterns. Right? right, and there's lifestyle, and they're. I think. I think they are pretty different. Um, there's an interview I just did recently with um, a, a director, uh, Oscar-nominated director, last year for a film called *The Look of Killing*, or sorry, *The Act of Killing*, and it's about uh, the si- '60s, and he follows two uh, Indonesian men mm-hmm. who are part of the death squads in Indonesia in the late '60s, and were responsible for hundreds of deaths. And they both seem to do, not want to take responsibility for this, these horrific crimes that mm-hmm. they, they committed mm-hmm. in this, uh, as they talk about them in the film. They admit it. They're, they're proud of it. It's really, really quite troubling, quite disturbing, and a great film. And a great interview, by the way, which will be on Face to Face very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the killers is in the car, and the director is pushing him a little bit about the morality and so on. And he starts to go, no, I don't, I don't feel anything any mm-hmm. shame, I don't feel any remorse, I don't feel any guilt. And he says something about George Bush, you know, bombing bombing Iraq and about morality being relative and mm-hmm. and and so on. But as the film goes along and you see these men in different situations, you start to think, hang on a second here, there's no way they're sleeping well yeah. at night. Yeah, exactly. I mean you have to rationalize at the some level or else you would drive yourself crazy. Sure. But how can you rationalize that behavior? Well, you deny it. Right. Or whatever, right? You deny it or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my dad spent uh, five years in Europe shooting at people, right, in World War II. Right. You know, but, you know, I mean, his, his process was total denial. He would never talk about the war. Right. Ever. Right. Ever, right. right? Right. So, I mean, my dad wasn't killed, but I'm only going to assume that he must have killed in order that he was not killed. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. He was in the front at some pretty grisly, yeah, grisly yeah. scenes. Yeah, and how do you, and how do you accommodate that? So, do you do you see yourself uh, uh, um, in a situation where you've got this decision to make? Are you are you the type of person that's going to say, you know what? No, I'm going to stand my ground on this because it is the right thing to do. Yes, it's, I know I, uh, you fairly well, having worked yeah. with you at Lamp and interviewed yeah. you before and so on. Um, I think you are. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think your supporters probably know that as well, and the people that have gotten behind you. But what's, what's your sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. But on the other hand, though, there has to be times in order to get anything done where you have to be, to some degree, prepared to compromise and work with people. I think it comes down to there are some certain fundamental values, certain fundamental pr- principles that you can't move off of, for sure, right? Uh, but on the other hand, you can't ignore um, incremental gains because right. you're not going to go from A to T, you got to go from A to B, right. right? So I always sometimes think, okay, as long as the boulder is rolling in the right direction, right. Right. I'll, I'll come back and move it to C next week. Right. You know. Right. But right. the principles, it's like yeah. The, well, it's strategy. It's, yeah, it's strategy. Right? It's, it's like it's, it's like toning down the rhetoric. 
It's it's rela it's relationship management. It's strategy. It's um, uh, well, you know, let's let's get another push in for my book here. It's absolutely. It's, it's incremental change, right? Yes, yes. And there's very there's very I can't think of many moments in history where it's gone from sudden change, right? I mean, you can look at the you can look at the human rights movement, and we were talking earlier about Rosa Parks and things like that. And yes, there have been pivotal moments when something has happened, but the lead up to that has usually been years in right. the making. Sure, right? sure. I mean, yep. the Civil Rights Act just wasn't proclaimed. It was many people, Rosa Parks being one of them, but many people pushing and pushing and pushing and failing many times until they got success. I think when you're dealing with bureaucracy, number one rule is you got to let them know you're not going away. Right. If they realize you're not going away, then you get somewhere because the first Interesting. the first reaction is always no 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 can't do it can't do it can't right, do it get right. shuffled off to somebody else so if your letter mm -hmm. doesn't get responded to write another one absolutely and keep writing them and then keep writing them and, and then a make a phone total call total pain in the arrive ass. on the doorstep do whatever yes, you can because bureaucracy is like everything calm you're creating a fuss what do we have to do to stop this fuss right you know and i think that's no rule number one of advocacy you can't go away and when I, I was involved with some tenants uh, on Sunday, they were dealing with some landlord-tenant issues, and they were having problems with the city getting the kind of response. And I said to them, realize, this is going to be a long fight, and for most of the time, they're going to act like you don't exist. And you got to understand that. Don't get discouraged by that. If you're prepared to do this fight, realize it's long, and realize the change will be slow. But if you stick with it, and you're righteous in your in your uh, aims, yeah, you can make change. So how do you get people to stick with it? It's different. And, and I don't mean just about their own issue because yes. they've got problems with their sewers outside their front door and they yep. need that attended to. That's a serious issue. We got yep. to sanitation, it smells, yep. it's all these things. We got to get this fixed. So let's attack the bureaucracy sure. until it gets done. Great, perfect. But let's talk about Rosa Parks again and, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thinking. Yep. How do you really affect that kind of change on a, a political level, yep. local level, because you really do need um, you need you need a groundswell of support. You do. You need people beside you and in front of you and behind you and picking you up along yeah. the way. Yeah. And the reality is, you're competing with every other social cause, which may have other great, uh, you know. Of course. Justify. Most of them do, right? That's right. But there's there's like a there's like a plate, and only so many food items get on the plate. Right. Right. Yep. So how do you get on the agenda, right? So you have to do. Sometimes you have to do the outright Greenpeace. Right? Greenpeace is an example. They do some, what some people would say, are outrageous kinds outrageous of stuff. Outrageous things, things, yep. But they keep the movement going. The toughest part about being a community organizer is to keep the movement going because those that are you're going up against, largely often bureaucracies, know that's the struggle you have to keep people engaged. So you have to do things to keep people engaged. It could even be fun things, whatever. But you have to keep the movement fresh. And, you know, the Rosa Parks uh, bus strike is an example of an act designed to keep, you know, a movement. I mean, that wasn't a uh, spontaneous thing that she did. That was well organized, right. well organized right. in advance. Everybody knew it was going to happen and, and had success, right? And so you have to keep those kinds of things going. You've got to keep the pressure. The advantage you have over bureaucracy is bureaucracy has a very small window of things they can do. And if you go outside their frame of reference, which mm. is letters, documents, reports, if you do something outside of their frame, you know, they don't know how to respond. So that's the advantage in the public realm that you have. You can do things like, you know, I'm sure there have been many letters to the Chicago Transit Authority about blacks sitting at the back of the bus, right? And I'm sure that all kinds of letters and they had sloughed them off, I guess. Right? But when she actually went out and did something that was right. outside of the bureaucratic frame and overnight organized the bus strike, they didn't know what to do. So, so be different. Be different, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Abs especially in a large bureaucracy or in a, or in a government. You know, you've got to be different. Often people don't really care until uh, an issue... Sorry, that's not fair. I was going to say often people don't care until an issue affects them directly. Maybe they don't have the resources to care. Maybe they don't have the capacity to care. Maybe they right. don't have the time or the effort or the income. Yeah. <clears throat> how do you, how do you, uh, yeah. how do you engage well, that's those true. people? Yeah, you mean, know, you're, and you're, you're, you're in the middle of it right now, knocking yeah. on the doors. Yeah, that's true because I mean, it doesn't affect people personally. And just like I talked about the plate having so many, well, same with individuals. My like, dad, my dad suffered from Parkinson's disease for right. close to 40 years. 
I probably wouldn't know very much about Parkinson's disease right. if I hadn't had a personal experience with it. Right. All kinds of diseases out there to support and get behind yes. and to yes. advocate it on behalf of. Could have been cancer. Could have been oh, whatever. It's wild, right? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. How do you get support? Well, I think you got to kind of relate it somehow to individuals, and certainly, um, I think you got to, in some ways, you got to relate it to people's own sense of justice. Most people get that something is unjust. They get it, and most people don't support it. The question is, most people don't do anything about it. You know, I mean, you can go to any example in history, the Holocaust, whatever. Most people would rationally say that is not something that any human being should ever support. But somehow the Holocaust did get significant enough support or at least ambivalence that it was allowed to happen, right? So how do you make people say, hey, wait a second, you believe in this and this is going on? How, how do you, you got to create some cognitive dissonance in people, right? I mean. You know, you believe that a counselor should provide service and your counselor isn't providing any service, so why are you voting for that person? Right. So it, se it seems to me, though, what, what happens is people, often folks tend towards the, um, the apathetic kind of response. Well, yes. therefore, okay, fine, I'm not going to vote then. Yes. Not interested in voting, not going to get involved, certainly not going to write a letter because it isn't going to do any good anyway. Mm -hmm. The guy's never in council. The guy never returns my phone calls. Yep. I, it took me ages to get this uh, issue yep. resolved and so on and so on. Um, well, I get that at the door. I right. get, uh, why are you different? All you politicians. Uh, are all the same. All yeah. the same. I hope I'm a politician. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> in, the, in the negative sense, I guess. Maybe that could be the campaign. I'm now a politician. That's right. Exactly, right? <laughs> I can see the t-shirts. Yes. And, and, and people say that. And I don't totally, I, I totally, I get that. Yep. Because the system isn't working for so many people. Right? It isn't working. It is inertia, beyond inertia government right now. And your, your best example is Obama in the United States, right? No matter what, he, there's so much inertia. How can, how can any, even the president get his agenda through? So I, I get that, that um, you know, people say, well, you're just going to be like every other politician. And, and, you know, and I'm sure there are traps. And there are many examples of politicians who went in for the right reasons, but over time, you know. Sure, yeah. So... Yeah, it's it's tough, but again, it goes back to reminding myself why I'm doing it, which is what yeah. I have to do some days when I have to go out knocking on doors. Not another door knocking day, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, it's every day. It's, I do it six days a week. You know, it does worry. So I get I come back to the whole anger hope thing that yes. we kind of started out the interview with, with you talking about that, and and it seems that in order to get involved, in order to fight back, in order to you know, campaign or knock on doors, you've got to be hopeful. Maybe yeah. anger is the, the, anger the fuel, going, possibly, yeah, or the yeah. catalyst. Yeah. But if you're not hopeful on some level, so I wonder, how do we, how do we in the, this business of social change, whether it's political or mm -hmm. social or whatever, how, how do we create the, um, I don't know, mm -hmm. packages of hope? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? and, 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 and if you're, depending on your life situation, but it may be very difficult mm -hmm. to have hope. Or mm -hmm. even if you do have hope, to have hope in the political system. Right. Because right. the political system has left so many people behind, right? I mean, we talk about youth, we talk about blacks that don't vote on average as much as people who are white, middle-class people. And they, people say, well, they should be forced to vote or whatever. But it's not because they're not voting necessarily because they don't care. They're voting because they don't have a choice that actually speaks to their issues, right? So if we're going to engage people, we need to speak to their issues. And of course, you only get that by actually knocking on doors and talking to people and finding out what those issues are. Answering the phone. Yes. And, and, and having a sense of integrity. Okay, this is why I got elected. You know, I didn't get elected for the limo, right? right. Right. I get I get elected to bring a voice to people who haven't well, already. And had. wouldn't you say uh, Rob, one of Rob Ford's major strengths was that maybe it still is, but the, that ability to yep. call people back. I mean, I've heard so many people in the press being interviewed oh, yeah. who have said things like, "Well, he arrived on my doorstep." Oh yeah, no, I've heard those. He stories. actually landed yes. on my door. Yes. And, and when know? he was a counselor, yeah, not so much when he was mayor, but when he was a counselor, yeah, there were people in the lecture. It wasn't his ward. We could all learn something from that approach it seems to me he had this uh, roll up the sleeves and customer service yeah and customer service that, back to that, that whole that, idea that was i mean and again this is what you've been doing for how many years at lamp uh, 14 14 years customer yep. service right yep. right That's in right. the middle of it yes. food banks and health clinics and yep. uh, meals yep. and 
yeah, dental no, and sure. medical, like the list is endless, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, it, it, exactly. It is about providing the service to people, and then I think it's an element of trust, right? Which gets built up over time. That's why I think I have a shot. I've right. been in the community for a long time, and I've spoken out a lot about issues like poverty and refugee issues and things like that. So people know I do speak these things, right? Which is when people say, "Well, tone down your rhetoric." Well. It's all on the record, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've been speaking about it for years. Right, right. You know, and uh, so. Well, and is is rhetoric really just? Uh, are they really referring to the the style in which you're yeah, presenting it? Yeah, out? Yeah, 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 yeah. That sort of angry advocate. <laughs> Make the rich pay. That's what I want on my slogan. <laughs> <That's> right. right? <laughs> you're not you're not handing out copies of the manifesto. Are no, you? no, 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 no. Oh, good, good, good. No, Glad no. to hear it. No, no. Yeah, that's excellent. So back to common urban agenda. Right. Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, we don't have to talk about the big issues here on this podcast. I think sure. the fact that, well, I mean, I think we kind of are, frankly, yeah. without actually addressing yeah. them individually. But the fact that you're speaking about people and about relationships and about making actual physical contact, yeah. it, it's a big deal. Yeah, because it is kind of removed from where modern day politics yes. are, right? Seems to I be. mean, the days of Harry Truman sitting on his porch every Sunday and people coming up to him and telling him what they thought of his government, <laughs> those days are long gone, those right? Those days are long gone. But yeah. I, w I was in Ottawa in 1969 and I was walking to Parliament Hill doing the tourist thing and Prime Minister Trudeau and Tommy Douglas were walking behind me. Wow. No security, nothing. Nothing. Right? Yeah. I lived in New Brunswick in the late 1970s, and Premier Hatfield's phone number, home number, was in the book, and you could call him. Yeah, that's pretty. Uh, you could pretty call amazing. the Premier. Yeah, all, you know? about, all about access. Absolutely, and yeah. we've lost that. Yeah, for we've sure. We've totally lost yeah, that, right? For sure. uh, you know, the G20, I mean, talk about no access, right? Wow. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, look. I couldn't believe your security here today, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> My God, I, I had a tough time getting through the metal detector. <laughs> that's but, right, yeah. exactly, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it just shows you how remote politicians yeah, have yeah, have yeah. become. But I mean, if you want to talk about the urban agenda, it, it's not that dissimilar from 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 other cities because yeah. uh, we are all in a kind of global economy and we are feeling the same thing. And of course, the most recent thing we're really feeling in a big way is income inequality, which directly has an impact on the city, right? Because the city does provide those kind of base level services, so the demands on the city because we have uh, adopted this so-called austerity agenda, which really means just putting it in between the eyes of people who rely on government assistance. That, you know, so you have those kind, the, the, the gap between the have and the have nots. And that, that really destroys a community when you have that wide gap. And, and especially when that wide gap is largely precipitated by political, political action, right? I mean, kids in school pay the tuition they pay today that's directly a political decision. It was the Mike Harris budgets in, in the, uh, the mid-1990s, late 1990s, that saw tuition go up by double digits every year to the point where we have them now. That, some things are very conscious, and that's one of them. It's about sticking it to people who can't afford it or making it so much more difficult. So no wonder people have lost faith in politics because for the past many years, it hasn't served them. It, this mythical austerity thing uh, has been the has been the recipient, and we know who's really been the recipient of that, and it hasn't been ordinary people. I think that you know, from my work in international development and getting more involved locally in the last couple of years, I, I mean, we're all in this together. You know, I mean, that mm -hmm. that sounds like a T-shirt or a and, bumper sticker, and, and it's the, corny, right? But I think there's a lot of truth in it, and, and there's a common. There's a commonality to all of us, whether you're in Cambodia or Burkina Faso or... Yeah. And or, in Toronto or, or in Toronto. Canada or North America, it manifests itself by paying taxes. Mm. We're in this together, therefore we need a base level of services, therefore we need to tax you. But taxation, well, you're not going to raise my taxes, are you? How many times have I heard that? Yeah, yeah. Right? As if... It's evil to pay taxes. Oh, I know. It's really interesting. You know? Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, recently quoted him in an article. Uh, I, I, pay, I pay my taxes and with it I buy civilization. Yes. Isn't that a great line? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Something like that. Yes. It's a bit of a paraphrase. And, and, and we, you know, based as a person... Oliver and I were very close. Uh, I, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and based on our incomes and all those kind of things, we've never paid lower taxes than we are now. Is that right? And eh? people still want to pay less. Right. Right. I mean, we want European services and American taxes. And and don't we think about paying less while we're complaining about the pothole that we yes. just bottomed out on? 
People are talking yeah. to me at the door about the potholes. <laughs> I mean, literally. And That's I'm going, this funny. God, I'm not running to, to fix so potholes. I got it. I was just going to say, what? so what has been one of the themes? So potholes have been a theme for you? Potholes have been a theme. It's, yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah. And it's, I'm it, sure it's very varied. It's very varied, yeah. but it, but it, the main theme is we're not getting any service from the city We're not hall. getting service. Our voice isn't being heard. Yeah. Our community <laughs> voice isn't being heard. I mean, when was a Ward 6 issue ever debated at City Hall? I can't think of one. Wow. You know? And uh, one of the mayoralty candidates, John Tory, has come out with his uh, transit plan, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very expansive thing. Except there's one quarter of the city, Ward 6, where nothing is taking place in his transit plan. Hmm. And is that a criticism of John Tory? Or is that just that John Tory's never heard about anything going on in Ward 6 Ward because it doesn't have any profile? Right. You know? So... Yeah, I mean, you, you know, issues in some communities have higher profile for good or reasons or bad. And our community has had zero profile. I guess everybody is supposed to be satisfied. But that, that reflects on the lack of services that, uh, that we're having. So, yeah, I mean, the right has been very effective in, in demonizing taxes, right? Because what it means is you're paying money and you're not getting value for your money. Right, right. Okay? And I've always said, I'll get you value for your money. Well, I... I mean, I uh, so I, for me as a philosopher, it's all about your starting point and your assumptions and your mm -hmm. premise and so on. I don't know. I look around and I kind of think I am getting value for my money. And I know I'm going to take some heat for that for sure. And I know a few of my friends who think I'm an, a, a lunatic for thinking that way. But I look at, you know, uh, there are issues. We can complain about anything any given time of the day. But look at our health care system, David. Any time you need our health care system for whatever, you get it. Yeah. For free. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you have the most rare kind of thing or whatever, they will do whatever they need to do. It's not predicated on, you got enough money for this right. test? Right. Right. You know? So, healthcare alone, right? And, uh, and you know, you're right. Civilized, civilized society. You know, people say, it's well. It's a membership fee. Yes. Right? Right. You, well, we need more police or we need more this. But I don't want to pay any more taxes. Membership fee. I can hear a few yes. of uh, my friends listening to this podcast cringing right now. <laughs> That's right. Well, it is. You want it. You want a collective society yeah. sure. to some degree. Sure. You got to be prepared to pay sure. for it. Sure. And uh, for years, we've demonized taxes. And and I mean, Rob Ford got elected on you know the so-called gravy train, right? Yeah. And the first thing he did was he brought in consultants to see where money could be found, and they basically found there was no waste in the city. But you know. I know a lot of city employees who are not highly paid consultants. And if you talk to any city employee for five minutes, they will tell you ways in which their money could be saved. Very practical, down to earth ways to save and money. And now aren't we back to the whole distance and yes. approaching the president on his porch yes. and access yes. and actually meeting people and shaking but hands? But the management of, or the leadership of City Hall will not talk to the average worker in the contents of how are we going to save money because we're stuck in this traditional labor management industrial relations. I, I, I worked uh, as an electrician for many years, 18 years with the same company. Mm. And one day in our, our paychecks, we were unionized, IBEW, and uh, mm -hmm. we got a note. If you got any ideas about how you think you can help uh, the company or save money, et cetera, et cetera, let us know. I wrote a letter to the president of the company, Bill Curtin, and uh, of 1,200 employees, I was the only person mm -hmm. who sent him a note and actually had a couple ideas. Now, maybe I was just a little cocky, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I actually saw it as an opportunity for change. Yes. Why not? Why wouldn't I tell yes. them a couple ideas that I've had? And holy cow, was I treated... Like you sold out. Like I sold out by some um, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the union, for sure, but treated by management and Bill and ultimately uh, very well and said, wow, you know, A, where did you learn how to write like that? You know, <laughs> gee, uh, let's talk some more. How come we didn't get more, you know? Right. I mean, maybe I could have campaigned at that yes. time, you know. Within... But you are breaking down the traditional labor management divide. Right, right, right. Right. And that's what we need at the city. Right. That's exactly. We need yeah. to break yeah. that yeah. down. Yeah. But that doesn't happen with the current administration trashing their workers all the time or trying to contract them out. You know, I mean, they're trying to contract out garbage collectors and office cleaners. I mean, yeah. the lowest paid workers, right? And what is what impact will that have on the city budget? Right. Negligible. Negligible. To say yeah. the least. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what it will have is, of course, when they contract out, we'll have more minimum paid. Yeah. Minimum yeah. wage paid yeah. workers in the city. 
So, uh, believe it or not, we got to wrap it up. We're we're uh, we're probably going to have to do a part okay. three. So you yes. didn't you didn't want to ask about the drunken stupors or? No, no, all the scandals. The crack. I, I'll leave. Yeah, <laughs> I'll leave. I'll leave that for the common Toronto press. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're drinking fair trade coffee. We are. Um, you arrived uh, today uh, in the in the parking lot uh, on a is it a is it a battery powered? Yeah, it's an electric bike. Electric, electric bike. bike. Yeah. I had no idea you were so sort of. Um, oh, I'm just cheap. <laughs> you're just cheap. <laughs> no idea you were so relevant for us. This is <laughs> yeah, awesome. right. You're 60 years old. What's I know. Going I, on? I know. All my daughter still says I'm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. That's great. You can't go like looking like that, Dad. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You're a politician now. You have that's an right. image to be concerned about. My campaign team has yes. made my daughter my image person. Your image She consultant. has to check me over before I go out. Like how to I'm an dressed. event or something? How I'm dressed, yes. That's funny. Are you shopping like in Harry Rosen now? Or? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm still Mark's work warehouse. That's right. <laughs> Russ, thanks a lot for joining us today yeah, on Face to Face and, and a uh, lot going on in your yep. life. That yep. is for sure. I wish you well. Yep. Uh, campaign uh, ends, I guess, on October 27th. That's right. So I'm and either going back to LAMP on the 28th or uh, maybe not. Or then some uh, different and real work yep. uh, will begin. And I'll put a plug in, russford.ca, if anybody wants my uh, campaign site. Absolutely. Check out the site. Uh, Russ could use with a few donations. No, I certainly uh, could. And yeah. you don't have to, uh, you don't have to live in Toronto to donate. Excellent. Well, thanks again for joining us, and we'll, uh, we're wishing you well for the Thank future. Thank you. Thank you.